Welcome to The Rebound, where we'll explore the issues facing supply chain managers as our industry gets back up and running in a post-COVID world. This podcast is hosted by Abe Eskenazi, CEO of the Association for Supply Chain Management, and Bob Troublecock, Editorial Director of Supply Chain Management Review. Remember that Abe and Bob welcome your comments. Now to today's episode. Well, hello and welcome to today's episode of The Rebound, How to Win in the Era of Dynamic Supply Chains. I'm Bob Troublecock. And I'm Abe Ashkenazi. And joining us today is Arun Kokshar. Arun is a partner with Carney, and he and his colleagues are also frequent contributors to Supply Chain Management Review, the magazine I used to edit. Arun, welcome. Good afternoon, Bob. Nice to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. Arun, I was fascinated by this topic last spring when you and I first talked about it, and I've since heard you present on it, and I guess I'm still fascinated. So let's start with a really basic question. As you define it, just what is a dynamic supply chain, and how is it different from how we've traditionally thought of supply chains? In other words, what's changed? Yeah, both the the word dynamic really stems from this idea of um, a you know, an activity that changes very often and and several times in an unpredictable manner. And that's really what we're seeing in the supply chains today, which is the change is unpredictable and it's happening very fast um, that, that cannot be planned for. Arun, when we hear a lot of terms and definitions of supply chain, there's value chain, there's a variety of different terms for it. Give us a sense of how this is different from a supply chain ecosystem and the the idea of a dynamic supply chain. Uh, Give me a sense of why this is different from a perspective. Yeah, the the way we define supply chains today is, first of all, more end-to-end than how we have looked at supply chains in the past. And what I mean by that is it really starts all the way upstream from your suppliers, supply chains themselves, and in some cases, their suppliers. And then downstream, it goes down to your distributors, your customers, and finally the consumer. So as we think about supply chains, the the definition has expanded and and it has gone end to end across the entire, what we call in often terms, the value chain. The second thing that has changed is is that within the supply chain, there are certain elements such as that we're going to get into in a moment around distribution, manufacturing, and planning. And what has happened is is that within those verticals, we have now micro supply chains within those, right? So as we think about planning, there's demand, there's supply, there's inventory management. And we're in a world today where there are the the supply chains become more end-to-end and there are lots of changes happening at that micro supply chain level. Uh, Arun, one of the outcomes of these changes um, is that companies can no longer meet their own supply chain requirements, or at least not do it independently. And, you know, we think back to the to the famous uh, Ford, uh, I think it was River Rouge uh, plant, where they did everything from, you know, bring in the uh, iron ore to make the steel um, to, the final, uh, to the final assembly. Anyway, so why is it that companies can no longer do that? Why they're no longer vertically integrated from end to end uh, and can no longer meet their own supply chain requirements independently? Yeah, it's 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 such a such a good question, Bob. There's been a lot of conversation about how there has been tremendous amount of disruption that has happened across the supply chain, and we are facing one roadblock after the other. It was the pandemic, then it was inflation, then we had geopolitical uh, tensions and 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 those tectonic shifts. And what has really happened is is that if you think about just a few examples, planning has become almost uh, impossible, right? If you if you think about the interest rates, how quickly they went up and how now they're starting to come down, no one really predicted such a rapid change. If you think about um, product design and, and innovation, we have uh, more than 80% of consumers that are urging CEOs to tackle uh, sustainability issues, uh, which again, was not on the radar for CEOs up until three to five years ago, or at least to the degree, not to the degree that it is today. Um, and if you think about distribution, we all saw what happened in the ocean markets over the last 24 months, where we had a logjam at the port of LA, and ocean rates went up to even twenty, thirty thousand dollars a container coming from China to the U.S., where they then you know, skyrocketed, and now they're down uh, more than 200 percent. 
the point of it all is, is that no matter how large you are as an organization, it is very, very hard to both predict and navigate these challenges on it, you know, on your own. And, and that's really what we're seeing as a, a big change now where big corporations are realizing they have to tap into their broader ecosystem to handle these supply chain disruptions. Hey, Arun, before I turn this over to Abe again, just one follow-up. You mentioned in, in the list of things, geopolitics, you know, and that um, just like sustainability wasn't, you know, as high on the radar, geopolitics really wasn't. Um, as companies start figuring out how to navigate the political relationships that they now have to navigate, what impact is that having on uh, the ability of, of you know, uh, companies to meet their supply chain needs? It's 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 such a it's such a big factor today, uh, Bob. In terms of global corporations thinking about not just their demand in terms of where the demand comes from, but where does the supply come from, and and it's not really limited to the behemoths of the world in terms of the global economy, such as the United States and, and China and Russia. We have uh, countries that are. Uh, relatively smaller, but still very important players, such as the countries in the Middle East and in Latin America, where because of a wide variety of reasons, it could be relationships between the governments or the stability of the government itself. There, there is a complete rethink as to where should I have my manufacturing footprint? Um, where should I source my products from? Because the consumers can tell where it was made or where it came from, and that influences their buying decision. So it, it is by far... The top three, uh, you know, topics on any CEO's agenda right now, which is what does their geographic footprint look like from a supply chain standpoint? Arun, interesting. I want to get into the, the supply chain as a service. But before we do that, I do want to dig into one of the areas that you're bringing up here, and that is the active management of your supply chain. Is this more than risk management that we're seeing because of the pandemic that you can't sit back, set it and forget it type strategy? Abe, it really is. And, and you're hitting on what I call two sides of the same coin, which is you have the risk management piece. And then the other side of that same coin is the ability to navigate whatever comes your way. And, and I call it resiliency or agility, right? Which is you can only predict as much and, and safeguard yourself against as much risk as, as, as your supply chains allow you to, as well as what you can predict. But there is a huge amount of unpredictability and having that agility or resiliency in your supply chain to address and, and quickly you know, pivot depending on what situation you face is really what we're talking about also, um, which is the unknown and how do you deal with the unknown in a small amount of time. Really interesting because obviously the role and responsibility has expanded significantly for supply chain professionals. So let's, let's dig into that. Uh, supply chain as a service. How can companies, how does this enable organizations to meet their needs in this new environment that we're all facing today? Yeah, the way we are thinking about supply chain as a service is actually not very different from some other concepts that we have seen outside of supply chain, such as, as you think about the subscription models in enterprise software, uh, where companies started to work with other companies who would provide softwares and hardware services, and they would not have all of those capability in-house. If you were to extend that concept to supply chain, we're calling this a SCAS model, which is supply chain as a service model. And it, it, it simply speaking, it really extends from one on the one end where you have supply chain expertise within the four walls of a company, which has been the traditional model. And on the other hand, and you have what we call a supply chain for hire and supply chain as a service where you go ahead and purchase a particular cap capability because it is available in the marketplace at a lower cost. And quite honestly, that capability doesn't exist within the four walls. Arun, you've broken this down into four components um, of supply chain as a service. So let's, um, going through this to the end, talk about each of those four. I'll kick it off with center of excellence. Walk, walk us through what is a center of excellence? Yeah, well, center of excellence is on, on the more initial stages of supply chain as a service model, where it's a little bit more traditional. And the whole idea of center of excellence is that you have within an organization, an entity, and that could be geographically in one region, but be providing service to several other regions or business units, 
But the point of it is that they that center of excellence has certain supply chain expertise and capabilities that the other business units and regions within an organization tap into. And it could be as simple as doing uh, certain types of manufacturing of certain products and it only happens in one uh, in one plant or within that center of excellence it, another example would be you would have a certain type of planning capability and it could be a demand planning or forecasting and for certain types of products or demand patterns you have that center of excellence team provide providing that service to other business units so think about it as a SWAT team that sits within an organization that provides that service to the rest of the organization. So could this, I, I wanted to use an example and run it by you and see if this fits in what you're talking about. Um, I did a story with uh, Pratt & Whitney a few years ago when they were getting ready to introduce their new jet engine that had demand they had not anticipated. So they really had to ramp up their manufacturing capabilities and realize that you know their relationship with their partners was really going to be important. So one of the things they did, I can't recall if they called them centers of excellence, but they had in various regions around the world where they had major suppliers, they had kind of, as you described, again, whether they called it center of excellence or not, where they had people from Pratt & Whitney who had particular skills who were then working with their, you know, either their, their parts manufacturers or other areas outside of their supply chain, you know, to bring them up to speed and integrate them within the Pratt & Whitney, you know, enterprise uh, to, to produce this new jet engine. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, very much so, Bob. And, and, and that's such a good example. And a couple of others that come to my mind are companies such as Kraft Heinz and PepsiCo. You know, they, they have these hubs. For example, PepsiCo has some digital supply chain hubs in Dallas and Barcelona, where they're able to do digital twinning and other types of digital supply chain experiments uh, and build capabilities that can then be scaled up and deployed. Um, similarly, Kraft Heinz has a global center of excellence in, in Netherlands and Holland, where they're able to provide that expertise to the rest of the business. And the example that you gave is a great one, right? With it, which could apply in manufacturing. Um, so yeah, you're, you're exactly right. That, that would fit under the bill of uh, center of excellence. Arun, following up, uh, the second is uh, in the in the rubric here is traditional outsourcing, which obviously has been a part and parcel of supply chains for decades now. Uh, explain how this fits in supply chain as a service, and it's more than just working with your traditional outsource partners. That's right, Abe. And as you as you rightly mentioned, outsourcing has existed for several years now, and it really became popular in the 70s, 60s, if I'm not mistaken, I might have the year or the decade a bit off, but when the whole low cost, cost country sourcing started to come in, in in fashion. And and it started with several industries such as apparel, where um, majority of the apparel giants started to move in that direction because of the low cost of labor and relatively lower cost of shipping because you could pack products in a, in a pretty tight um, cube. But what we're talking about here is very different in the sense that we're talking about outsourcing, as I was mentioning a moment ago, micro supply chains and not those macro supply chains such as manufacturing and distribution. We're talking about within you know, manufacturing or within planning certain elements of, of your supply chain. So take, for example, what we have seen is that a company like Bacardi has outsourced its management of distribution or freight in North America, but not necessarily the contracts with the freight providers themselves. So it's a, it's a micro activity within your freight operations that's been outsourced. A similar example, I would say, is with a company like Mark Anthony Brewing and Mark Anthony Brands, where the Mark Anthony Group actually has built a strategic partnership with a distributor in the United States called Mark Anthony Brewing that provides that contract manufacturing capability which has equipment that's patented by Mark Anthony Group, so they're IP protected, but it's outsourced to, to a provider and, and, and they can only focus on brand development and product innovation. So, so these are very unique partnerships that are a combination of micro supply chains as well as JVs and strategic partnerships. Um, Arun, the third component is unique partnerships, uh, which to me also implies partnering with peers. You know, we're hearing more about this. Um, you know, Gap has opened up 
its distribution centers and transport uh, transportation providers to other retailers. Is the market, you know, explain A, what it is, but B, is the market ready for this? Yeah, th th this is where, Bob, we start to get into the realm of um, uh, somewhat uncharted territory in the sense that we are starting to get into partnerships that are, in some cases, even shared PLs. In some cases, it's joint debt and equity structures. And, and and also shared risk by virtue of doing that. And a couple of examples, some that have existed from for you know several years now, such as the Coca-Cola ecosystem, right? Where Coca-Cola, the brand owner, is separate from the Coca-Cola bottlers, and not to mention that they have split and combined six to seven times over the last several years. But it's a very unique partnership, right? Where the Coca-Cola bottlers don't necessarily bottle products for Coca-Cola's competitors. Right, but it's a, it's a very strategic partnership. Another one that that comes to mind is with Nestle, right? They, they have and and Red Bull, right? They have several of these partnerships where it's a very unique strategic partnership um, that is um, you know that 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 is new and more and more companies are moving in that direction because it distributes the risk while protecting IP, you know, and and creating an integrated supply chain across um, the whole value chain that we were talking about. Rune, let's get to the fourth point here, and that is what you refer to as supply chain for hire. Give us a sense how this works. Yeah, and this is this is the one, Abe, that where we start to get into the um, absolutely cutting edge and bleeding edge idea of supply chain as a service. If you think about every element of that extended supply chain that we were talking about, product design through all the way to customer service, you would have almost a stack of supply chain service providers who you could go to on a daily, weekly, monthly basis as and when your needs change. It's really no different than going ahead and trying a new branded shampoo or a toothpaste. And, and while it might seem provocative, that's really where we're moving towards. You have companies such as Bosch and IDEO who provide product design capabilities that are off the shelf. And you also have similar companies, whether it's uh, Jabil or Flex, um, Foxconn, to a certain degree, that provide manufacturing or contract manufacturing capabilities, not just for products that are well-designed and uh, established, but also innovative products. And, and this is where companies like um, Kylie Cosmetics by Kylie Jenner, as well as Shopify, come to mind. If you think about Kylie Cosmetics for a moment, they don't really have any infrastructure balance sheet per se. It's all a brand-led innovation engine. And they are relying on these value chain providers who manage their end-to-end -end supply chain. The other piece that's unique about this part, this archetype is that it makes your speed to market super fast, right? Because now you suddenly have a plug and play type of a relationship with supply chain providers and you can change very quickly. Rune, before we wrap this up, Give me a sense of how an organization starts to take a look at this. Is it a strategy discussion? Is it a competency? Is it collaboration? Where do companies, you know, start this discussion on using supply chain, you know, in a dynamic environment? Yeah, you know, the way we encourage um, companies to start to think about this is in really five steps. And it, it all starts with thinking about what capabilities do I have and where are those gaps in my capabilities within supply chain? And those gaps could be both in terms of navigating uncertainties, as well as in some cases, not being able to deliver on your consumer promise. That really then sets the stage for starting to talk about how much value can I unlock if I were to go ahead and have a supply chain as a service model, right? and, and which then steps us you know, into the third stage, which is, well, now let's start to think about how do I approach my supply chain upgrade and, and what exactly would that change look like? And then before you actually go ahead to the final step of scaling for uh, your SCAS model, as we are starting to call it, there's a fourth step which talks about how do I establish a sustainable arrangement? And this is an often overlooked step, um, which is what would the pay as a service model look like? Is there a is it a joint PL arrangement? Is it is it a risk reward relationship? And then finally, you get get to step five, which is scaling uh, with your you know with your entire demand. So in a nutshell, it starts with verifying capabilities, identifying scope. Number two, starting to think about what value are you going to unlock. 
Then comes number three around the approach for upgrading our supply chain and where are you going to upgrade it? Number four is what does that sustainable arrangement look like? And finally, number five is scaling it for consumer demand. Arun, I can't thank you enough. There's quite a bit to unpack here, and I'm sure we could spend almost an hour on each one of those topics there. Um, I do want to thank you. Uh, this is all the time that we have today. A special thanks to our guest, Arun from Kearney, and a special thanks to you for joining us today. We hope you'll be back for our next episode. And for The Rebound, I'm Abe Ashkenazi. And I'm Bob Troublecock. All the best, everyone. Thanks. The Rebound is a joint production of the Association for Supply Chain Management and Supply Chain Management Review. For more information, be sure to visit ASCM.org and STMR.com. We hope you'll join us again.